And greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show live and on demand here on Blaze TV radio and podcast. I'm Steve Dace. Todd Erzin is here with me, as is Aaron McIntyre. If you'd like to join us today, we would love to know what you think about what we think. Steve at SteveDace.com is how you can email the program. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Steve Dace Show. If you prefer doing business with the free speech alternatives to those platforms, you can also uh, look for Steve Dace on MeWe on the allegedly anti-Semitic gab. At least that's according to Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Gab is anti-Semitic, I guess. I don't. Okay. But you can look for Steve Dace there. Uh, you can also uh, follow me on Parlor at Steve Dace. Todd, you have a look on your on your face like, is this breaking news? It, it, apparently no, it I'm... is. I mean, this is a, a Greg Abbott no. knows something. I guess the rest of us don't know, I Th- guess. This is what this guy decides to flex on? I mean, this? Take, take off your mask and suddenly we start having um, uh, delusions of adequacy. Seriously, Texas. Come yes, on. I, I know. I know. If If... If you would like clips of this show uh, that you would like to sample and share with others, go to youtube.com slash Steve Dace. Again, that's youtube.com slash Steve Dace or rumble.com slash Steve Dace show. All right, coming up on the program today, we'll play our little game of three non-political questions. Next hour for Theology Thursday, I'm going to call an audible. We were slated to finish our study of my book, A Nefarious Carol. We're going to do that next week. In fact, I made the decision today. Now, we're heading into spring, heading into Passover, Easter season. And and I think given where we're at culturally, we could use some encouragement. Straight up, no tongue in cheek. So the next few weeks on Theology Thursday, I'm going to focus on that. And... I think we've we have subjected you guys to a lot of darkness on Theology Thursday. Uh, going back to how many months ago when we started revisiting a nefarious plot, right? And the conclusion to a nefarious carol, unlike its predecessor, it ends on a redeeming note. So it will fit into this conversation too. But there's a story out today from of all places, the Atlantic. That is one of the most theologically and historically astute premises I've ever seen asserted in mainstream media. Now, given the source, it could very well be accidental. Uh, It could be, hey, we found the needle in a haystack print. It, It could be that, I don't know that these terms mean what you think they mean, but in light of that story, and also, I did an appearance this morning on a major markets morning show. And it was a fascinating 30-minute conversation back and forth on where we stand historically. I want to give some encouragement to all of you. Now, to some of you, this may not seem like encouragement. Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. But I, I'm actually very, very encouraged. And I think those with ears to hear will be very encouraged by what we're going to talk about on Theology Thursday next hour. At the bottom of this hour, our good friend Joel C. Rosenberg will return. He has another brand new book out, sure to be New York Times bestseller, but there's a lot of drama going on in his native Israel right now. He'll be joining us and we'll talk about that too. But before we get to all of that, here's Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by $1.9 trillion. The U.S. House of Representatives passed the $1.9 trillion COVID-19 relief bill yesterday, sending it to Joe Biden to be signed. Just over 20% of the nearly $2 trillion bill is going to $1,400 per person stimulus payments, with those phasing out at incomes of $75,000 per year per individual and $150,000 for married couples. Today in coronavirus history, 
history, a look back at the great leaps in science brought about by the virus. 12 days after comparing COVID-19 to a, quote, severe seasonal influenza, and less than 48 hours after telling young people they can go on cruises if they want to, Dr. Anthony Fauci testifies in front of Congress that we're looking at Captain Trips. I think if you count all the cases of minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic infection, that probably brings the mortality rate down to somewhere around 1%, which means it is 10 times more lethal than the seasonal flu. The country of Denmark is the latest European nation to suspend the use of AstraZeneca COVID vaccines after numerous reports of serious blood clotting. Denmark joins Austria, Estonia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, and Latvia in suspending the AstraZeneca vaccine developed at Oxford University. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan announced the state is lifting capacity limits at restaurants, stores, and venues to 50% capacity. The Texas Rangers might be the first sports team in America to allow its stadium, Globe Life Field, to open at 100% capacity for opening day. Fans showing up to watch the team will be required to wear masks. In Los Angeles, three Kroger-owned grocery stores announced they are permanently shutting their doors due to the excessive cost of hazard pay to their workers. On February 24th, the L.A. City Council voted to mandate larger grocers and drug stores pay an extra $5 an hour to workers for a period of four months. A new poll from Politico finds only 53% of registered voters support banning dudes from competing against your daughters in athletics. The poll found 59% of men support banning, 46% of women support banning, 56% of millennials support banning, but only 50% of boomers support banning dudes from competing against women. Something many missed tucked inside of Joe Biden's January 25th executive order on transgenders is a clause that allows the U.S. military to pay surgeries for dude troops who think they're lady troops. And finally, what happens when a radical feminist mom tries homeschooling with comedian Ryan Long? Last week, I pulled Marcus out of Zoom school when I found out they were teaching him about Nazis like Christopher Columbus. Now, this occupation is called a leather daddy. Homeschooling with mom has been way worse. She's just teaching me all this weird stuff. Now, babies happen when sex takes place between a trans man and a trans woman, or a trans man and a man, or a trans woman and a woman, or in some cases, a man and a woman. Any questions? Uh, we're me. taking questions from people of color first. And that's what happened while we were away. <laughs> We all require coping mechanisms for the day and age in which we live. Um, that's why I want to try our friends over at Patriot Wine. Um, it's a drink that's 10 times healthier for you than the average wine. It is uh, made down in Argentina, T Argentina, he said uh, easily in English, uh, where they make this really dark red wine from Malbach grapes that are grown at 9,000 feet. And... These wines have 90% less sugar, fewer chemicals, fewer addi additives. Um, they taste great with notes of blackberry, leather, cherry, smoke. All three of us have tried a sample bottle of uh, Patriot wine. It is absolutely outstanding. All right. So if you want to give it a shot, you can get foreign imported wine for 50% off uh, right now. 50% off shipping if you want to go to PatriotWine2021.com. Again, that's Patriot Wine 2021.com. Get 50% off shipping for some amazing wine at Patriot Wine 2021.com. In the overtime today, we will be discussing the polling results on sports and training madness. If you are a Blaze TV subscriber, we'll be recording that overtime for you right after the program today. And then it'll be uploaded to blazetv.com slash dace, where you'll be able to watch it later today once it's uploaded at your convenience. If you're not yet a Blaze TV subscriber and you would like to become one, you can also go to blazetv.com slash dace and get a discounted subscription today at blazetv.com slash dace. Get a discounted subscription today. So you can watch not just our overtime, but all of the various uh, exclusive content items that we provide for Blaze TV subscribers here each day at blazetv.com slash days. So let us uh, go into Aaron's montage, shall we? I love what the Texas Rangers are doing, including the masks. I have finally found a masking policy that I agree with. And here is why. 
I, I think what we require here, you know, the enemy loves, loves chaos. There's a study that just came out about that uh, rendemzivir. Remember that was the first big pharma therapeutic yeah. for COVID last year, right? Yep. Scott Gottlieb and all the big pharma whores were promoting that, right? right. Okay. Guess what? Guess what, guys? It works even better than we thought. Yes, it doesn't work at all. Okay. Yeah, Chimos. randomized controlled study says it just, it, 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 they can't quantify that it actually works. Okay. How so, long I've been telling you about big pharma, brother? Yeah. Well, meanwhile, we've had drugs on the market like hydroxychloroquine, and I can't remember this new one that has been emerged, but is another uh, drug that they've been using as a prophylactic for is it, it's a Vestrum or Evanestrum. It's IV something. Okay, so you guys, pardon my memory. It's it's still really good, just not as good as it used to be. Um, but I mean, these are relatively cheap drugs that have been on the market for a long time. And we have some documented uh, record that they work if COVID is detected early enough as alongside of zinc as a working prophylactic in order to insulate you from uh, more lethal evolutions or forms of COVID-19 once you're infected. By the way, what's interesting, too, along those lines is our friend Alex Berenson has been combing through the Israeli vaccine information. And today, almost as if they're doing this in response to him, Pfizer put out a statement today about the Israeli numbers, which, but if you look at the what they put out, they're, they're, it, it's actually not in conflict with what Alex is claiming the raw data, raw data shows. They've just adjusted their message. The, the message that Pfizer put out earlier today that I saw basically described their vaccine as a prophylactic. That it worked to lessen the likelihood of hospitalization and death. That it wasn't just like you're never getting this. You're never ever going to get it no matter what. But instead of, because what Alex has been noting is the rising case numbers in Israel after Despite the fact, and why does Israel matter? It's the most per capita vaccinated nation in the world right now. And so what Alex has been noting is the rising case numbers in Israel, despite the um, per capita vaccination. Well, what Pfizer did this morning that I saw was essentially alter its messaging to, hey, our vaccines, is the numbers in Israel show when it comes to serious infection or hospitalization, they work. But, and that's great. By the way, if true, that's phenomenal, except we've actually had products on the market all along that could have been doing that, too, that we knew that we just chose to blaspheme against them. Um, remember, the Lancet study came out last year, the big one that showed that hydroxychloroquine didn't work. And then they had to retract the study because it was total garbage. You won't remember that. Good thing is it'll be in our forthcoming Fauci book. All that stuff is all all of it will all be in there. OK. But what's happened this past year? It, it, there's been a cloud over this country and over much of the world. Where it seems in too many places, the truth is unattainable. You know, what Denmark did today with the AstraZeneca vaccine. I will tell you, as somebody who has been on the on the front lines of this story from day one last year, Denmark as a country, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have cited their, their data. They have been more forthright, transparent than just uh, when it comes to COVID than just about any nation on earth with the possible exception of Sweden. And we keep being told these contrary things. And for a lot of us, or for a lot of you that don't do this for a living every day like I do, but you pay attention to shows like this, it's, it's a mind scrambler, to quote the great movie Weird Science. It, it's, it's hard. What, what, just tell me what the truth is. Now, how about your friends and family members that don't watch or listen to shows like this? But yet... Their lives and livelihoods and, and ways of life are at stake in this ordeal as well. 
how much more difficult is it for them? What we need are some Mount Carmel moments. We need some things that make the truth clear. You know, we can sit around the city gate and pontificate and you bring your best apologetics and I'll bring mine and you bring your best hermeneutics and I'll bring mine. Who's the, who's the God here in Palestine, in Canaan? Who is it? Is it Baal? Is it Asherah? Is it Molech? Is it Chemosh? Who is it? Is it Jehovah? Who, who's God here? Who's in charge? And on a given day, if you've got the more eloquent speaker, the people go with you. But who knows whether anything was even proven. You convinced people, but that doesn't necessarily mean you proved anything, right? Right. Just means you had the more convincing argument or arguer. We need some Mount Carmel moments. We had one recently, the chart put out by CDC on school reopenings that showed in a lot of places in this country where schools have been open the entire school year, they should not have been. People got to look at that and said, wait a minute, my kid's been in school all year long. He just finished his high school football, high school basketball season. What are you talking about? That provided a moment of clarity. And I like clarity. Clarity is my friend. It's yours too. Well, it is if you just want to know what the truth is. Does it have to be your truth? The truth that makes you feel good? The truth that rubs your belly? Pats you on the head? Now, if you believe that the truth is its own reward, regardless of what it is, you're never afraid of clarity. I'm never afraid of it. Bring me the clarity. Here's a little tip on the dope rhyme. Don't pray for patience. You'll regret it later. <laughs> pray for clarity. Lord, more clarity in this world. We've lacked a lot of clarity in the last year, especially. That CDC school chart provided a lot of clarity. Because people around the country know whether their kids are ready in school or not, right? Right. They know whether their kid is in a, went to school and, and, and got hospitalized because of COVID or not, right? Right. They know whether the teachers got COVID for teaching their kids for the past year or not, right? Right. Clarity. Clarity. We got clarity. That's why I said at the time it was a turning point, and it's turned out to be. The reopening momentum has soared since that date. One moment of clarity like that won't be enough, however. We need more. That's why I love what the Texas Rangers announced yesterday. Because of the lack of clarity, the spirit of the age and its panic porn peddlers and its scientism fanatics and its flat earthers and its voodoo um, shaman and its rain and moon dancers have gotten away with asserting things that are not true simultaneously one of them could be true both of them could be false one could be true and the other false but they can't both simultaneously be true they've gotten away with it for the better part of the last year there have been some places where they have it pockets of shall we call them resistance like this program and others but even with all of our combined forces and might we're we're um, a vapor on the wind against the zeitgeist of the spirit of the age. But on opening day, 20, 30, 40, who knows how many people will actually come if it will sell out or not. But the potential for a full stadium there in Arlington with masks outdoors will occur and 
Oh, the game is indoor. My bad. Thank you. Um, that will either become a super spreader event or it will not. Either the masks work or they don't. If the masks work, they don't. But if the masks work, then why are we social distancing? Similar to if the vaccines work, why do I still need to be a leper? This is the this is the pothole that Anthony Fauci has stepped in in the last month. Everybody get vaccinated and then go home and be a leper. Well, which is it? Do the vaccines work or not? If the vaccines work, I should resume normal life after receiving them, correct? Yep. Um, yes. The only reason I would not resume normal life after receiving them is that they don't work. And that includes, why am I wearing a mask when I'm vaccinated? If the masks work, then why don't we have full stadiums? And no, it's too late for the Swiss cheese defense. Well, you know, the ma- it's, a, it's a formula. Some social distancing. So, no, no, no. The previous CDC director testified before Congress that this mask would protect him as a wearer even more than a vaccine would. The mask has been held up as a symbol, shall we say, idol of salvation. If it works, then every stadium on opening day should be full with people wearing masks, right? If they work that well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, every the NCAA tournament, every seat at Lucas Oil Stadium, fill them up. Let people come in, wear their favorite team's mask, the mask of their school colors, Right. Either they work or they don't. Either the vaccines have efficacy or they don't. What we need on numerous fronts, but on COVID most of all, because that is that is the epicenter of what's happening to us as a culture right now. What we need, you want here's the vaccine we need. Clarity. Clarity. I love the fact that the Rangers announced this about a month before opening day. Everybody's already talking about it. Everybody's already on the record. It's not just, hey, a bunch of Alabama fans got together after they won the national championship, weren't wearing masks, and then we forget about it when the numbers don't come in. Because either the Texas Rangers are going to be canceling games in two or three weeks in the middle of the baseball season, or they won't. Or they won't. But what we need, enough studies, which are often not controlled studies, by the way, where there's no control group. When you run a mask study that says, hey, you know, uh, 90% of the people that wore masks didn't get the virus. Well, there's no control group. I don't know what the percentage of the people that didn't wear a mask that got the virus was. So that doesn't tell me anything. I'll walk up to the hottest chick in the world. I'm your best bet. If there's no other dudes for her to vet, I'm her best bet. Because I'm the only bet. Up against some other uh, men, though, I'm in that control group. Probably not her best bet. Of course you're going to get those kinds of of numbers when there's no control group. I don't know what the percentage of people who got it that weren't wearing a mask. For most of the last year, clarity has eluded us. It's maybe even been denied. It is time for clarity to have its day. It's time to let the clarity out of its cage. If the vaccines work, After getting fully vaccinated, go back to your way of life. Never wear a mask again. If the masks work, open everything up, everything, and we'll just wear masks. And it's okay. One or the other. Time to call some bluffs. Gentlemen, you have any thoughts? Well, you mentioned clarity um, has been withheld from us perhaps over the last year. And, and a key part of that is that video 
that uh, that's been played ad nauseum. We've used it numerous times on this show over the last year of Dr. Anthony Fauci going before Congress saying this is going to be 10 times worth worse than the seasonal flu. Now, there's an example of clarity, either withheld uh, maliciously or just we don't get it. Was he saying, was he talking about the IFR or the CFR there? That's never, that's a question that's never been answered. That testimony, along with the WHO announcing a pandemic that day, that was, that was the impetus for shutting life down. I mean, it was building to that point, but that was really the impetus. That was the, that was the domino effect right there that got things into motion. And the reason, the, the reason largely, I believe we haven't gotten clarity is because we've allowed ourselves, in large part, with very limited exceptions across the globe, to be ruled, ruled, yes, ruled by elites in uh, the profession formerly known as pharmaceuticals and uh, medicine. And I, I posted yesterday on Twitter, you can feel free to agree, disagree, the things that elites fear the most in order are embarrassment, having humility, and death in that order. <laughs> I think that's the main reason. Because they couldn't admit at the very beginning. They couldn't have some humility. They're afraid of that. And they couldn't reverse course later and tell you the truth because that would be embarrassing. They couldn't admit at the very beginning that they really didn't know that much and that we need to just, we, need, which, we just need to give them some grace, maybe. Instead, it was, uh, it's going to be 10 times deadlier than the flu, 12 days before saying it's going to be the seasonal flu, of uh, uh, a seasonal flu. 48 hours before that, yeah, young people can go on, on, on cruises. It's this thinking over and over again. I can't admit that I was wrong because that would be embarrassing. I'm right all the time, as Dr. Anthony Fauci said a few weeks ago, talking to Reuters, I believe it was, or maybe it was the UK Telegraph. There were no mistakes. That's exactly, that's exactly how we got here. You know, that big pharma company you start talking about at the outset, changing its... Pfizer. Pfizer. Yeah. You know, the truth ultimately was some pretty good news. Not perfect, yeah. right? So you got to ask yourself, why wasn't the truth good enough? You go way back to the beginning a year ago in March. You remember when I told you multiple times, if we had to get a pandemic... We actually have some pretty good news on that front. This is the best pandemic we could have hoped for. It's predictable within demographics. We already knew that. That was good news. Why couldn't we rally around that? Why did we want to do everything we could not to rally around that? What was relatively good news? Again, ask yourself the question. Why was the good news and it was everywhere from the beginning. It really was about this. Why was it never good enough? There are no good answers. Anything that, any, any treatment that didn't begin and end with cutting edge pharma was rejected. Yep. Look what they did it, to a black woman, Steve. Yes. Demon sperm was, lady. All, all the mitigation efforts were basically the proto version of a green new deal. Okay. On and on and on and on it went. Coronavirus is a real thing. Yep. Yeah. COVID-19 is a real thing. Never letting a good crisis go to waste is a real thing. There it is. It's a real thing. Best-selling author Joel C. Rosenberg will be joining us here about his new book and what's going on in Israel. Contentious politics in a moment. Stay tuned. You know, trying to sell or your current home or buy your next one in any real estate market can be challenging, but especially in these unprecedented times, Ding. you definitely need to make sure that you find yourself a real estate agent who will come in, take charge, and then be trusted to deliver the results you want when it matters the most. See, Glenn Beck and some of his associates learned the hard way. You can't always count on that. 
And they didn't want the same thing to happen to the rest of us. That's why they started this company, realestateagentsitrust.com, because they wanted you to be able to find an agent whose track record of success was verified, fully vetted, so that you would know, hey, this person knows they work for me. I don't work for them and I can trust them as well. So where do you go? Just about anywhere in America. There might be some remote outposts. We can't help you, but pretty much anywhere in America that you want to move to. We get, uh, just go to the website. It name says it all. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Again, the name is realestateagentsitrust.com. The name of his newest and sure to be best selling book is The Beirut Protocol, and the author and an old friend of the show, Joel C. Rosenberg, joins us. Good to have you back here, Joel. How you doing, brother? Thank you, Steve. It's great to be with you from Jerusalem, of all places. Indeed. First of all, tell us about the new book. I mean, you just roll over, out of, you roll over in bed, get out of bed in the morning and just uh, pop out a, a bestseller, it seems. So tell us about the most recent one. Well, when you don't know how to do anything else, Steve, it, it, it helped, <laughs> right? You know, I, you're very kind, but you you and I met when I was in my career as a as a as a failed political consultant. Nobody I ever worked for won, not even the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, who's the longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel. But when I worked for him in two thousand, he went nowhere. So he just had so, to fire yeah. you and then everything's gone perfectly ever since then, right? That is true. And my friends started <laughs> saying, work for the other guy in any race and you'll be fine. So I turned to political thrillers, and this is the new one, as you say, the Beirut Protocol, and it is ripped from maybe tomorrow's headlines. Uh, Marcus Riker's the hero, decorated combat veteran, uh, wounded in battle in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, works for the United States Secret Service. Some tragedy in his life forces him to leave government service, but he eventually comes back working uh, undercover for the Central Intelligence Agency. And in the Beirut Protocol, he's up on the Israeli-Lebanon border. The U.S. Secretary of State is coming to the region because she's trying to finalize the mother of all peace deals, a Saudi-Israeli peace deal. And yet she's worried, the U.S. is worried that Iran and its terrorist proxy forces like Hezbollah in Lebanon are going to do everything they can to blow up the Saudi-Israeli peace deal. So Marcus is there a day before the Secretary of State's arrival to make sure everything's okay, and it's not. Chapter one, big attack on the border by a Hezbollah terror cell. Marcus and his team are in a firefight with the terrorists, but he and two of his colleagues, one American, one Israeli, are captured, pulled into a terror tunnel deep underneath um, uh, Lebanon and pulled deep behind enemy lines. And while he and his team are being tortured, there's a massive missile war blowing up up on the surface. And that's the opening chapter of the Beirut Protocol. Wow. Oh. So we've talked over the years about your books, how they're ripped from the headlines. There's a lot of talk right now about maintaining the peace deals that were made in the final stages of the Trump presidency, where those will go in the future. Um, in, in here in the opening stages of the Biden presidency. And then I saw an interesting tweet from you uh, about maintaining some of those deals, particularly when it comes to uh, the health of Bibi Netanyahu's wife. Can you tell our audience about that? Well, yes. Actually, today, Steve, as you and I talk, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu was supposed to fly to the United Arab Emirates to meet with the crown prince of Abu Dhabi, um, the de facto leader of the UAE, a man named Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, commonly known in this region as MBZ. It was MBZ and Bibi Netanyahu, uh, Bibi is his nickname, uh, that forged the first of four Abraham Accords deals. MBZ took tremendous courage to make the first Arab-Israeli peace deal in, a, in more than 25 years. And today, they were supposed to meet. Today is MBZ's 60th birthday, and yet Netanyahu canceled the trip, and this is his fourth time canceling. Apparently, Steve, the cancel culture has come to the Middle East, and it's a big diplomatic faux pas. Uh, now, admittedly, uh, Netanyahu's uh, wife was, was put in the hospital last night. She's got an infection in her uh, appendix, so we pray for her. But that's not, there's nothing really he can do to uh, you know, to make her better. She's got great doctors, she'll be fine. But to cancel for the fourth time, 
And there's always been a reason. But this is less than two weeks before an Israeli election. And not only is Israel in a spat almost, I mean, the UAE, the Emiratis are being nice about it, but it is the fourth time. It's not done to cancel a state visit four times. But in the meantime, part of the other reason that Netanyahu says he didn't go is because the Jordanians wouldn't give him overflight rights over Jordan to get to the UAE. Why? Well, we can get into that if you want, but basically Bibi is in a problem with two Arab states on the eve of his election trying to be reelected as the big, you know, uh, global statesman, and uh, it's not going well. It's been a month, so it must be time for another Israeli election. You have alluded to it a couple of times already. What, what's the condition on the ground there? How politically solid is he right now? He is not politically solid at all. Listen, I worked for Netanyahu on his comeback campaign team in 2000. This was just after he lost his first re-election effort in 1999. Steve, Bibi Netanyahu is in the most serious political danger that he's ever been since 1999. Okay, that's what's the situation on the ground. Now, it's true Netanyahu and his Likud party are going to be the largest faction in the parliament after the March 23rd elections. Uh, they'll probably come in at around, you know, 28, 29, 30, 31 seats. But the problem is his pathway to form a government which requires at least 61 seats is narrowing. I'm not saying he can't do it. Netanyahu is a shrewd political cat and he has had more than nine lives, it seems. I mean, he always finds a way. But there are more leaders of all the other parties today saying they will never serve with him, even parties on the center right that have always been loyal to him than ever before. So his pathway forward is difficult, and there are other leaders who are starting to emerge. Israelis are starting to think maybe the Netanyahu era is over. Did he stay too long? Uh, no, well, in a, in a world where there's no term limits, uh, any political leader wants to run as far as they can. Uh, the problem is Netanyahu is, while he's a genius in, in, in certain areas and certainly in keeping Israel safe and in, in forging four Arab-Israeli peace deals uh, and so forth, domestically he's being, he's being wounded deeply by his handling of COVID, okay? Uh, almost 6,000 Israelis are dead. And while that doesn't sound a lot, to, the, to America, a continent, here that's more Israelis having died in the last one year than in the last 25 years of war and terror combined. Hmm. That combined with unemployment and, uh, you know, 70,000 businesses going out of business. And so no he's getting it from all angles. Basically, if, if you're if you're if you're covid panicked, too many people died. So he's getting it from those folks. Then if the other folks that want the country open because economically you're dying from this are like, well, we we lost our businesses, our way of life shut down and we still had all these dead. So what was the point? So basically, he's getting it from both sides of the covid argument with equal he disdain. He is now to his credit, and, and, and he, there's many areas he gets credit, and one of them is uh, Israel is almost entirely vaccinated now. Within the end of the month, we will probably be at, at 100% of those who want to be vaccinated. Obviously, there are some who don't want to be, but so Netanyahu's done well on that. But you, he's got a lot of people, again, the heads of other parties, who don't necessarily disagree with him on policy so much. They've just had it with him. He's a, he's a, he's a unique character, a strong cup of tea. Uh, and some people have just feel like he's worn out his welcome. Now, we'll see. I, I, I do not count this man out. Um, but I'm just telling you and, and, and many people in the United States and around the world who, who Netanyahu is the only leader they know mm -hmm. in Israel. They've never heard of any of the other voices. And on our news site, All Israel News, we're trying to profile some of the leaders that people may start hearing more of um, if the Netanyahu era is over. And again, we're not there yet, but people are starting to talk about it in a very different way than ever before. You mentioned the emergence of new leaders following your site in the last couple of weeks. I've seen the name Benny Gantz come up a couple of times uh, in, in, in very provocative um, settings. Who is he? So Benny Gantz um, is the defense minister. He was the former chief of staff of the Israeli military, one of the most decorated, respected generals in, in Israel's history. However, 
he and he and, and last election, which was last year, he was the head of the largest faction, and Netanyahu had to make a deal with him because Netanyahu couldn't put a government together as, by himself. But many Israelis were very angry at at Gantz, and uh, because they didn't want to deal with Bibi, they think that Bibi's day is finished. They wanted Gantz to put together a government without Netanyahu. So, but because of COVID, Gantz made a deal. And and now Gantz's numbers have just fallen precipitously. So he is not a major player currently, though he's a significant uh, leader. I mean, he's certainly a very uh, you know respectable man. The the two the two name the three names that people should pay attention to are Naftali Bennett, Yair Lapid, and Guidon Sar. They are all the leaders of smaller parties, but all of them have a potential pathway if they work together, that one of them emerges and replaces Netanyahu as prime minister. I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying it's more likely than we've ever seen in the past. From an American perspective, which of those names would be most favorable if they were to emerge? Well, look, Israel's left wing has essentially been obliterated over over time. We're one of the few Western democracies that really don't have a left wing anymore. And I I have to say as a conservative that I'm happy about that. Um, So the country (laughs) is center right. Okay. Uh, Yeah. And you're welcome to come back over once the country opens and see a country that the fight is on the center right. It's, Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing to behold. So the two real leaders that are most likely to emerge would be Guidon Sarr, who used to be the number two in Netanyahu's party till he couldn't stand Netanyahu anymore and left last December and created his own. The other guy is Naftali Bennett. Bennett was Bibi's chief of staff until he couldn't take it anymore, formed his own party, forced Bibi to make him defense minister in a previous government, and then Bibi fired Bennett. So these two guys, one, or Guidon Sarr said, I'll never serve with Netanyahu. Naftali Bennett has played it more shrewdly. Bennett um, is saying, I- I'll serve with whoever can form a stable right-wing government. That is making him in Israel known as the kingmaker because nobody can form a government without Naftali Bennett. Mm-hmm. And there is a scenario in which Bibi can't form the government, Netanyahu can't form the government, and that even though Bennett will probably only get 12, 13, 14 seats, not that many, he may be able to form a government if he wants to, uh, to replace Netanyahu, and and Bennett could actually become the prime minister. So a lot to watch for the March 23rd elections coming up here. I've got about a minute here. What does Iran want to happen in that election? Well... Uh, Iran hates us all, wants to annihilate us all. Iran is not interested so much in in the Israeli elections. They are very happy with the American elections. Why do I say that? Because Joe Biden and his team seem to be heading down the same road of appeasement toward Mm -hmm. Iran that that Biden and and his boss at the time, Barack Obama, put together in the Iran nuclear deal. And uh, just one example, uh, Biden has taken one of Iran's terror proxy forces, the Houthis, off the terrorist list, even though every day almost Biden's team has to condemn the Houthis because they're firing ballistic missiles from Yemen into our ally Saudi Arabia, even into the capital. This is a huge problem. Uh, and, and Biden is, you know, he took 30 days or more to even make a phone call to Bibi Netanyahu. Um, and he hasn't sent anyone over here at a high level to meet with the Israeli government. And the Israelis are starting to get nervous that that, that Biden is more desperate for a deal with Iran than the Iranians are desperate. And that he that the Biden is squandering the maximum pressure advantages that the Trump team put into place. It's a very real problem. And, and the Beirut Protocol is a novel that deals with a what if scenario about Iran and its terror proxies creating a war with Israel. That is actually a, a real scenario in 2021. But the, but there's, it, there's complications at multiple levels. I'll just summarize it by saying Iran doesn't worry about who's the prime minister of Israel. They are trying to, 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 to lure Joe Biden 
into a disastrous nuclear deal. And that would not only anger Israel, it would name anger uh, and, and, and create fear within all of our Arab mm -hmm. peace allies in this region who are who say that Iran is the threat, not Israel. Name of the book, The Beirut Protocol, sure to be his latest bestseller from our good friend Joel C. Rosenberg. Good to see you again, brother. Thanks for joining us out there in Jerusalem. God bless. All right, take care. God bless you, Steve. Thank you. You bet. It is the best tasting protein bar you've ever had. It will be the most nutritional candy bar you've ever eaten as well. It is a fantastic product that we can't rave about enough known as Built Bar. 160 calories or less in every bar. 20 grams, up to 20 grams of protein in every bar as well. Just three to five net carbs, low sugar, low carb, low calorie, whatever healthy lifestyle you are pursuing. Built Bar fits in over 20 flavors, all of them covered in real chocolate. The, the new decadent flavors, I, I mean, they don't call them that. It's just the flavor is so decadent. They're phenomenal. Uh, the chocolate chip cookie dough, coconut brownie chunk. You will not do better than this, I promise. If you've never tried it before, Take me up on it. 20% off when you use my name, Dace, as the promo code at BuiltBar.com. That's B-U-I-L-T at BuiltBar.com. Now, maybe you've tried them before. You want to try them again? Get the same discount off your next order at BuiltBar.com. B-U-I-L-T, BuiltBar.com. Use the promo code Dace. I promise you will not regret it. When we come back for hour two, fascinating article of, in, of all places, the Atlantic that absolutely just nails it and why this could be an encouragement to us. We'll get into that for theology Thursday next. Stay tuned. And we're back with our two live and on demand here on blaze TV radio and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erz and Aaron McIntyre. All of you let us know what you think about what we think. Steve at Steve Dace.com is the email address. That's D E A C E. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Steve Dace Show, and also on the Free Speech Alternative social media platforms as well. Look for Steve Dace on MeWe, Gab, and at Steve Dace on Parlor. If you're looking for clips of the show, you can watch for free, and then hopefully you're going to share with others. Go to youtube.com slash Steve Dace or rumble.com slash Steve Dace Show. And if you're a podcast listener, so many of you are, thank you. We appreciate you. We would ask that you also, though, show your appreciation for us. Whichever podcast platform you prefer, if you haven't done so yet, smash that subscribe button. Uh, give us a five-star review. The more of those we get, the more it helps the podcast to grow. We want to thank each and every one of you that has done one of or both those things for us already. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, three non-political questions, but let's get to Theology Thursday. Brought to you by Raycon. Now, I know a lot of us these days feel like we're always looking at some kind of a screen. Uh, and whether you're an avid news watcher or maybe just in serious need of a distraction, unplugging is easier said than done. One of my best favorite ways to rest my eyes, I'm a huge podcast listener. And you can put, you can still get access to all of your favorite podcasts, putting on your Raycon wireless earbuds while you're listening to something great. Whether you're catching up on your favorite podcast or it's an audio book like my new book, A Nefarious Carol, uh, or powering through a workout with a pumped up playlist, a pair of Raycons in your ears makes all the difference. They fit snugly. You won't have to keep moving them around. That's one of the things that annoys me about my previous set of earbuds is I love the way they would sound. You get a good sweat, though, going, right? And you got to mo motion them back in. But then you go to motion them back in, and then what happens? You, oh, wow. you, yeah, they, or, or, or they turn it off, or they go to the next podcast, because you hit the yeah. button and everything else. You don't have to worry about any of that with Raycon. A good, snug fit, and it makes great sound, accessible to everyone. Wireless earbuds, great noise reduction. And they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. Raycon offering you 15% off of all of their products right now, if you're a listener or viewer to the Steve Day Show. Uh, buy Raycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N. Buy Raycon.com slash Steve. That's it. And you'll get 15% off your entire Raycon order today. When you go to buyraycon.com slash Steve, 15% off your entire order today at buyraycon.com slash Steve. 
I saw a news story this morning and I thought, um, we need to talk about this. And it's providential that I saw it on Theology Thursday. And you know, it's, I think, an important topic if I'm going to put off a week shameless self-promotion by talking about my own book, right? Like when I texted you guys this morning and said, hey, I'm calling an audible on Theology Thursday, you were like, what have you done with Steve Dace? Crap's <laughs> getting real now, right? <laughs> okay. If something, if you came up, it's got to be really good. Something really came up that's really good for Steve to say, no, I don't want to talk about myself or my own work, right? So something really good did come up. And I saw it like right after I got off the phone. I did a radio interview this morning uh, in a major market. And I've been on this show before. And, and maybe I knew, I just didn't realize or remember because we'd never kind of crossed the Rubicon on this yet. Because the host and I have a lot of similar interests and views. He's a generation older than me. But for the first time, it came out in our conversation that he's an atheist. And so I think he just would describe himself as a conservatarian atheist. Brilliant guy. Love being on his show. Makes makes my brain break a sweat. You know, a lot of times, frankly, when I do appearances, it's, you know, barely gets has to warm up. But he makes my brain sweat, and I respect that. And so, during our conversation this morning, he and I kept coming to this impasse. In fact, during one point of the conversation, we had, we had a lot of the same views of what was going on and why, but we were, like, arguing. It was polite and friendly, sure. you know, but we, but we were arguing. And at one point I stopped in the middle and started laughing. I'm like, where do we, I can't, where do we, we're arguing here, but I can't figure out where we disagree. I can't figure out where we disagree. And that's when the topic of his um, religious skepticism came up. And I, and I, after he explained that, I said this all, now it makes sense where we disagree. Because, I mean, he's telling me how terrible the Republican Party is, how he wants the Republican Party in his state to burn to the ground. And then he turns right around and he's very concerned seeing ter Ray, Ray, Richard Burr is a terrible Republican. Roy Blunt is worse because he's also from one of the reddest states in the country. These guys retiring is good news. But he's like really worried, you know. I know they're not good, but they're, you know, what do we lose these seats to Democrats? But then he wants the Republican Party in his own state to burn. There's a lot of conflicting, conflicting thoughts there. And when he talked about his religious skepticism, that's when it made sense to me why we're at an impasse. Now I know that we're what we're arguing about. Because from my belief system, from my worldview, I see opportunity from his. He realizes that it's the charge of the light and the loafers brigade, but it's the last line of defense and then the Visigoths are coming over the wall. Does that mean we're, yeah, he knows they're terrible, admits that they are, but without an acknowledgement of the providence of God, it looks like it looks like an erosion is happening, right? And we got and and these guys are the last layer, and then after that, there's nothing between us and them. But from my belief system, what I see is opportunity. I see a pruning, and as I explained to him, I I come from a belief system. You know, the world knows a lot about the three hundred of Thermopylae. A lot of it because of Zack Snyder and the hit movie 10 years ago. But I come from the belief system of the original 300. Gideons. That's too many people. The Lord said, that's too many. That's too many. You know what? That number 300 is just right. Give me the most committed. Now, go take on the pagans. I come from a belief system where the Messiah became a celebrity. Everywhere he went, he attracted massive crowds until the system turned on him. Those crowds abandoned him. Some of his own disciples did. 110 people in an upper room wondering what the future looks like, whether they have one, whether they can leave this room safely. In the next 40 days, 
they will put their fingers through his nail-scarred hands. They'll receive the Holy Spirit. And they'll take a giant leap to changing the world. A group of pilgrims get on a rickety boat. They're not escaping the Ottoman Empire, guys. They're not escaping the Muslims. They're not fleeing Imperial Japan or some Chinese dynasty. They're fleeing people who are every bit as white as them, have the exact same accent they do, serve the same tea times that they have, have a lot of the same civic customs and rituals and traditions and outlooks that they do. They're fleeing their own people, their own king. Half of them died the very first year. They founded the new world. We are coming up on Passover season. Easter season. At the Passover, Moses and the Israelites are trapped between a large body of water they cannot cross and Pharaoh and his armies who are angrier than a hornet's nest. They're not entirely sure what's going to come next. Moses isn't entirely sure what's going to come next. But he's entirely sure of who is going to come next. And he looks at the people and he says to them, stand still and wait for the salvation of the Lord. Were you there when they crucified our Lord? When he took all the sins of the world upon him. Every sin I have committed, I'm committing now, will commit in the future. And for all of you within the sound of my voice. We talk a lot about, wow, these are some dark times. I'm not sure it gets much darker than we literally killed God. We literally killed God. We did it. That's dark. But then on the third day, the stone was rolled away. And he walked out of there like a boss. See, if you don't have that belief system, you're right. These are scary, dark times. It is far more likely than not. You are living in the death throes of American civilization. It is far more likely than not that any new endeavor that we would try or attempt on a civic level won't work. That even if, even if Donald Trump puts all of his combined might, money, and everything into an effort where he doesn't make, at times, perplexing primary endorsements, but only people that would be Steve Day Show certified. Donald Trump calls me up after the show and says, Dace, here's the 30 races I'm playing in, you pick the candidate. And all 30 win. And they all get seated in a governor's mansion, in the Senate, in the House. That'd be a tremendous victory, right? Yes. It's quite possible, though. Even if we were to pull something like that off, we are so outflanked now culturally. We just delayed the inevitable. The host asked me this morning, hey, I'm really worried about Joe Biden's dementia. Are you going to watch his speech tonight? And I said, nope. I'm gonna, it's March Madness. I'm going to watch college basketball. And he laughed. I said, no, I'm dead serious. That's what I'm going to do. The Israelites were in captivity for 70 years. The prophet Ezekiel told them, tend your lands, have marriages, celebrate, raise your babies, make babies. 
live your lives. Yes, you're in captivity. But I've still blessed you in the midst of that captivity beyond what, frankly, you deserve. Enjoy it. And it would be ungrateful of you. You'd be an ingrate. You'd be worthy of further and worse captivity if you did not enjoy those simple things. So, I'm going to fight like mad for the future of my kids and grandkids this entire workday, like I do most workdays. And then when the workday ends, I'm going to kick my feet up, knowing full well that these could be the death throes of this once great civilization. But I'm going to kick my feet up, chill out, grab the remote, watch some college basketball, and then get up in the morning, clock in, fight the war again. Because God is good all the time, all the time God is good. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, if you don't have that assurance, these are dark times. They're likely going to get darker. The U.S. military is currently purging people that believe like us while providing mutilations, eunuch operations free of charge. That's the military. Yesterday, 500 student athletes petitioned the NCAA to never, ever hold championship events in states that will not allow women to, or men to take opportunities away from women by pretending to be them. Yesterday, we were inspired, stirred, blown away by the priest in Ohio who laid down some holy ordinance. And then after it was over, we sat around here and looked at each other in real time and realized we're a year into this thing. And that's the first time we've seen someone in ministry show up at a public civic event in the government's face and do something like that, right? Yeah. So if you lack that assurance, then you should be scared. You should be concerned. I can't help you. Your fear comes from a right reading of the current predicament. And a, if you play out all the numerous scenarios, you have Dr. Strange over there with his fingers up, meditating on all the various scenarios of how this ends. We are in the end game now. And there's very few that don't end poorly for this once great civilization. However, if you know what the occasions of Passover and Easter are about, fear has no place for you. Now, this is not to mean you, we should be assured that we'll see an American revival. We may not. So, so what? The pilgrims probably thought there was never going to be a day that they would find more fertile land for their freedom amongst what they thought were the savages here in the new, in the new, in the new world than amongst their own countrymen, but they did. Who knows? We're living in an era, as Joel C. Rosenberg just pointed out. Did you ever thought you'd live to see the day that the Saudis and Israelis are on the same side when it comes to foreign policy? They have the exact same interests. Maybe the day will come in the next decade or two that it's friendlier for people like us in a reconstituted Saudi Arabia or a more, even more open Dubai. Maybe that'll be the case. Okay. No more winner then, I guess. That's not bad, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Now, hey, I, I love this country. I'm going to fight to the end for it. Because, not because of its flag or its relics or any of that stuff, but because of its creeds. Because of the things it was founded upon that have been outside of the church, one of the greatest blessings this world's ever received. 
But sooner or later, all good things come to an end, Jean-Luc. We have history books for a reason. We have encyclopedias for a reason. The idea that your particular civilization is immune from ever being listed in them as the artist formerly known as is idolatry. And that's what struck me about this piece in The Atlantic today. It points out that America's religious fervor is actually every bit as ignited as it's ever been. And I agree. What do you mean, Steve? We're secularizing? That's a religion too. But The Atlantic even makes the right connection. It says, as Christianity wanes, as Christianity wanes, New religions are political religions. Religious fervor over our political beliefs, tribes, takes its place. And the Atlantic is exactly correct. This is, there's two major arcs to all of human history. The persistent, never-ending, relentless pursuit of the grace of God against his rebellious creation and children. That's number one. God's zeal and desire to redeem us and our zeal and desire to reject it and rebel. That's number one. But number two is that every culture will either worship the one true God, the living God, or idols. Once a culture rejects God, turns from God, as ours has done, it will begin worshiping idols. When missionaries show up in cultures to bring the gospel, what are they up against? The idolatry of that community, that tribe, that culture. So as we have turned from God, we are turning towards idolatry. And idolatry always leads to civic and sectarian unrest. Always. Why? Because warring sides debate with each other whose idol is worthy of the idolatry. Who's the true idol here? This used to be a melting pot. E pluribus unum. People from various customs, cultures, coming here, uniting under one commonality that our rights come from god and that government's ultimate purpose is to defend those god-given rights that's gone folks and barring revival it will not return if we've learned anything in this last year of covid is that the amount of americans who are willing to be free has tremendously diminished sooner or later all those years we gave the kids up to the schools, to the universities, we gave the schools and the universities up to the spirit of the age, sooner or later that harvest would come due. Sooner or later that price would be paid. And Uncle Bingo, it is time now to pay that check. We're here. And you know what? It's okay. If this is the end, and it could very well be, can any of you within the sound of my voice who believe in a sovereign God make a claim that it's not justified? I certainly cannot. Now the Lord chastens those whom he loves. I actually find the darkness, the reckoning we're heading towards encouraging because I just want clarity. I just want the truth. To me, it's a sign we're being disciplined. That our daddy has not given up on us. Now, to what end? Who knows? Maybe we'll see an American revival. Maybe we'll have to revive these traditions someplace else. Like the people who founded this country in the first place came here to do because they had to leave where they were. But this is not a time for despair. 
be encouraged. Things are coming to a head. Be encouraged. Your enemy is not lying anymore. He and those he has deceived could not be more honest. I think the truth in a lot of places in our culture today, that's been my great frustration with COVID, the truth has been difficult to acquire in that story, but really on every other front, culturally, the truth is out there now. We know where everybody stands now. It's all clear. I mean, I, I, that should set you free. I feel free. I know where you stand. You know where I stand. May the best worldview win. And if my worldview doesn't win here, I didn't lose. You did. Your creator has decided to let you have your Romans one way that you want. And I'm not angry with you. Frankly, I pity you. And he'll find us the next new world or Petra where we will all go live or other places as he's called us to live. We can't lose. This country either returns or gets what it deserves. <laughs> either way, God is just. So do not be discouraged by what is happening. Prunings are usually a good sign. When there's a pruning, when it seems as if the darkness has been allowed to have its way, I don't know. History, as, I, as I've read it, seems to indicate something really cool, powerful, cosmic, is on the horizon. But I want to make sure we don't miss it. Because we are very tempted to also fall into idolatry. America, no matter what, no Stand for the anthem no matter what. No. I'm not going to stand for the anthem of a country when it points the gun at my head and says, bow the knee to the spirit of the age. Then I'll honor the country that you once were and not acknowledge that. That is our temptation. Those of us who read history through the lens of a sovereign God Our temptation is to succumb to one of these political idolatries. That doesn't mean don't use the political system. That doesn't mean don't run for office. For goodness sakes, our entire theme this year is the answer is us. And if you think that's what it means, then I fear you've already fallen into that idolatry. It means what is true is the truth. No matter which side is in charge, no matter whose idol is being acknowledged, no matter whose monkey is being loved on sprockets, the truth is the truth, whether it's from your uniform or not. The truth of the matter is, I'd rather have, if I were living in Ohio, I'd rather have abortion feminist Naomi Wolf, my governor right now, than Mike DeWine. She's actually willing to look critically at the number one issue facing your freedom and putting it into a ditch, not him. See, that's the idolatry we must avoid. You know what the system, you know what this world, this culture needs more from us right now than anything else? They need to see us live in the joy of the sovereignty of God. We got nothing to worry about. Whether it's morning in America again or the sulfur falls, God is just and either one of those outcomes are deserved. Don't fall into the political idolatries. For some of you, I have noticed your pride about not succumbing to any form of partisanship at all has become your idolatry. You're better than everybody else. You're superior. 
You won't even you won't favor things that clearly are in favor of your belief system because so and so and such and such isn't worthy of carrying that banner. You don't anoint banner carriers. He does. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies those whom he's called. Move where the food is. Where you see him working, go there. Idols abound in this culture. The temptation to succumb to them. And then justify it later. And maybe none more powerful and tempting than our self-righteousness idol. Smash every last single one of those. Check your motivations and let the outcome be up to a sovereign God. If there's no other lesson to learn from Passover and Easter that we can apply in a civic sense than that, then I don't, I don't know what is. But be of good cheer. All things work together for the glory of God and for those called according to his purposes. More in a moment. Uh, guys, I told you yesterday I got a new batch of uh, Brooker's Founding Flavors ice cream uh, at the house yesterday, a couple days ago. And remember, I told you that I was a little disappointed because that their version of like a death by chocolate I didn't get after raving about it. It is still the best chocolate ice cream I've ever had. I was a little disappointed until I saw that they did put in there, though, their, one of the specialty flavors for, for March, for St. Patty's Day. It's their Shamrock Smash. And you guys know, for me, it's a tie. Oh, we know. Okay. You know, it's always pumpkin spice season for me. Okay. But my two favorite combinations, and it goes back and forth, chocolate and peanut butter and chocolate mint, right? I love both of those things, right? Guys, I, Noah and I opened up this Shamrock Smash last night. Imagine a Shamrock Shake from McDonald's mixed with one of those Andy's uh, chocolate mint shakes at Arby's. That's like their Shamrock Shake competitor this time of year. With huge chunks of Oreo mint Oreos. Okay. In just rich, thick, creamy ice cream. That's what this was. Noah and I took a bite of this last night, looked at each other like, of course, a podcast listener can't see the look on my face, but this stuff was just, It's the last time it was the best chocolate ice cream I've ever had. Mint chocolate chips, one of my all-time favorite flavors of ice cream. This was the best, the best variation of that I've ever had. I mean, I, I could not believe how good this was. I say that every time because every time this ice cream comes through. All right. So during the month of March, you can try out the Guns of Boston flavor, which has got, I've got that one, by the way. I haven't tried this one yet. Chunks of Little Debbie oatmeal cream pies in it. Um, the flavor celebrates evacuation day when the Brits were forced out of Boston during the Revolutionary War. I mentioned the Shamrock Smash. Notice the trend here. Unlike those other communists that do a, a similar ice cream, which is not this good, by the way. This is better than that. These guys at Brooker's Founding Flavors, all of them come with a historical bent that actually upholds our values and traditions, including the Shamrock Smash, Mint Oreo Cookies, Chocolate Chip Brownies, Andy's Mints, in mint ice cream, it is absolutely phenomenal. You're going to find these flavors and a lot more when you go to their website. Brookersicecream.com, B-R-O-O-K-E-R-S. For Brookersicecream.com, click on the Ship Nationwide tab. You will thank me later, I promise. Brookersicecream.com, click on the Ship Nationwide tab. All right, let's get to three non-political questions. 
We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? A question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on The Steve Day Show. Three non-political, hopefully decent questions on the Steve Day Show. Question that number one. That doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, Todd, does yeah. it? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully decent. The first time you asked the new missus out, hopefully this goes okay, yeah. right? Um, um, uh, uh, somewhat good questions. Uh, what, what's the name of the Undertaker and uh, Princess Bride? I can't remember his name. Uh, somewhat good is mostly bad uh, in that. Yes, band. yes. Uh, question number Fastest one. Fastest growing segment on the show. <laughs> yeah. Who is on your Mount Rushmore of college basketball cl- players? Players? Yeah. Um. I, well, I get on a personal level, my all-time favorite college basketball player is going to be on the list, and that's Glenn Rice. Okay. So I got to have one personal pick. I'm going to go with guys I saw. Otherwise, I mean, do I put? George Mikan on the list. Do I put Lou Alcindor on the list? Bill Walton on the list, right? So I've got to have some form of a cutoff. So I'm going to go with guys I saw. Uh, Patrick Ewing. Uh, even more so than Ralph Sampson, Patrick Ewing was, the in, in my lifetime, the most dominant physical presence I we ever saw, in, in, I thought, in college basketball in the paint. Uh, and again, my first game was 1983, so... You know, most of Samson's college career was actually done by then. But, but I mean, the uh, how intimidating he was. And when I was first getting into college hoops, I mean, he was just a seminal figure. So I'm going to put Patrick Ewing on that list with Glenn Rice. Um, this is going to be harder than I thought it was going to be. I'll, I'll share mine if you All want. Right, yeah, you go ahead. Let me think about it. Uh, for me, it's Johannes Airbear, Jimmer Fredette, Taco Fall, and Adam Morrison. All because I think they all have strange Taco names. Taco Fall. Strange names <laughs> and or strange mustaches in the, uh, in the case of Adam Morrison. America. <laughs> he just... I tried. He just Jimmy kicked me right there. Yeah, it was a, he just totally set me up right there. No, that's my. Th- those I'm are my I'm trying to like pontificate and, and seriously go through stats and other yeah. stuff, and <laughs> the only- you bust out with Adam Morrison, Jimmer Fredette because of their these, mustaches. These questions are for your truth, whatever your truth is about your what makes truth. sense. The I only like thing that would have made Aaron's answer better is if he queued up the the ball is tipped music yes. right yeah. when he started talking. All right, Christian Leitner has to be on the list. As much as I hate to admit it, man, but. I mean, he's he's arguably the most decorated college basketball player of my lifetime. So we, Leitner, Ewing, Rice, and I've got to come up with a guard. So you go ahead while well, I think of what guard we I'm are throwing. We are mind at. melding exactly because I interpreted to see the most like what when I think of college basketball, not even necessarily my favorites, but they epitomize it. Mm-hmm. And my list is exactly the same so far, except I replaced my personal. I have Ewing, I have Leitner. And I have Frank Kaminsky from the Badgers' mm-hmm. great, amazing run in the National Player of the Year. So now I got to think of a fourth as uh, well. And Aaron's list was not helpful in that regard. You know what? I'm gonna if I'm gonna pick a guard, I just think that's the hardest thing because it's such a guard-driven sport that it's hard. It's harder to distinguish these guys from themselves. You know what I'm saying? Like this is not a center-driven sport anymore. It was in the 60s, 60s and 70s, and so it's it's harder to argue who's better player, Bill Walton or Lou Alcindor. It's much easier in our more contemporary era to figure out who the greatest centers are because it's not a dominant position anymore. The guards, I think, are more difficult. But I, I'm going to go, and I, and I know I'm going to forget about somebody more obvious if I do this, but I'm going to go with Kemba Walker. Yeah. When you talk about the run that him and UConn had that year where they had to win the Big East tournament to get in, remember? And they had to do it four games in four days. And then they turned around and then went six in a row in the NCAA tournament to win the whole thing. Okay. So I'm going to go Kemba Walker. I'm going to go Glenn Rice, Patrick Ewing, and Christian Leitner. Of course, I don't have a point guard, but we'll figure it out. That's a good one. You know what? I'm going to do your team a solid uh, because I think it 
speaks to the changing uh, trend since then of college basketball. Not necessarily for the good, but it wasn't his fault. Chris Webber. Fab Five, yeah. the most notable one out of those five. Yeah. Uh, coming in and having that much influence as a freshman two years in a well, I mean, two years in a row, they went to the final. So I'll say Chris Welber. Okay. Question two What's the weirdest argument you've ever had with another person? Um, the one I had this morning was weird until I figured out what we were actually arguing about because it just, we were going back and forth, but we seemed to, uh, on that show, seemed to actually have the exact same agreement. Um, uh, this is another hard question for me to answer because I get into arguments about minutia all of the time. Okay. When it, when it comes to pop culture stuff, um, I'll go with, um, I'll go with our whole family argued. You know what? I know what I'm going to pick. I was convinced that Luke Skywalker was not Darth Vader's father or, or was his son i was convinced it was a lie and back in those days the movies weren't on hbo and the internet so you you either went to the theater or waited three years for the next one to come out right and i remember when return of the jedi was about to come out we lived in orlando florida and i and um there was a bookstore by the school and i went over there after school and um and they had the those storybooks they used to come out with, you know, the story of Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, with the glossy pages. You remember those when we were sure. kids? And I went over there. This is the movie was not out yet. It wasn't coming out for another couple of weeks. But they already had like a lot of the books and stuff in the bookstore. I went over there and spoiled Return of the Jedi because I was convinced Dave was wrong. He was adamant that that absolutely this was true and one of the greatest one of the greatest shocks of all time. I thought the whole thing was a lie. There's no way Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's dad. And I mean, we argued about this for three years. And then I went over to the, I went over to the bookstore uh, to find out if it was true uh, to spoil the movie basically. And lo and behold, it turned out to be true. And I was wrong. So that's uh, that's quite a thing, Todd. Uh, dumbest arguments. Is that the yeah weirdest, dumbest, whatever. Uh, pretty much every argument I have with an Iowa sports fan. <laughs> I like it. Gauntlet thrown down. I like it. Aaron? I'm just letting the camera look at uh, look at the face <laughs> of Smug right there. Um, that's, but he owns it. He owns yeah, the Smug. Basically every argument I've had with Todd. Uh, <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think, I think the weirdest <laughs> argument that I've ever had is a few years ago, Steve and I got in an argument about whether rugby is more masculine than football. I was contending that it was. Steve did not think so. That was a weird argument. Another weird one I got into is I, when UConn was at their one of their heights of undefeated runs, and I had made the case that I thought that they could, you know, beat like you know, uh, a team of like McDonald's All Americans. That was a dumb argument. Okay. They, they, they couldn't have beaten a team with McDonald's All-Americans. That's one of the dumbest arguments I think I've ever made. So there you go. Roger that. Question number three. If you could go back in time one year ago today and tell yourself something, what would it be? Hmm, that's a good question. You were right. <laughs> See, that was the first thing I was going to say. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All, All of it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, be more, even more aggressive, yeah, yeah. be even more aggressive. I have friends of mine that worked in that white house that we were friends before he got elected. I wanted to give them space and not violate those friendships, particularly because I was a person who didn't vote for him to get into office the first time. And I waited too long to be aggressive in trying to penetrate that bubble with my relationships. And by that point in time, the narrative cat was out of the bag. If I would go back and tell myself one year ago, be more aggressive and sooner about going to your relationships inside the white house about what is going on here. Don't wait until June, July, August to do it. Do it now. That's what I would tell myself. 
Because if you do it now, by June, July, and August, they might listen to you. If you start in June, July, and August, there's uh, you're damming the river after it's flown downstream. It's too late. I have pretty much the same answers. I don't have the connections, obviously, he has, but um, you could... I, I don't know. I, I don't have any... If I had only moments, I don't think the three of us have, because really, since last March, this has been all-consuming, um, and we stuck our necks out, and we've been proven right each and every time. Uh, so maybe um, smoke them if you got them, or... Um, drinks are on me or something like that because we've done good work here we're damn proud of it i think the biggest mistake in my thinking about covid at least early on for the first uh, four or five months or so i just assumed um i just assumed the american addiction to entertainment and luxury and um um largesse I I assumed that that would win out eventually. That it wouldn't last. That that this willingness to shut it, to shut ourselves in for this long, not go party, things like that, not go to games, not do the things that we usually could do, not do things that were just the most convenient. I assumed that that would win out sooner, and it really still hasn't won out. It's starting to a little bit more, and maybe not for even not for even the same reasons. But I would tell myself, don't. That's a great point. Yeah. Don't assume. It's I, I why I said last segment that we have learned in the last year, a lot of Americans no longer wish to be free. Mm -hmm. that, See, that's that, what I'm... That we will even put our decadence yeah, aside, decadence, yeah. our, our, our complacency, our convenience aside in order to be um, subjective. That's, that's, that's a bad place, guys. Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. don't, don't assume entropy with with the coronavirus restrictions don't assume entropy with 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 the idolatry of of fear that's probably what i would tell myself you know march is national crafting month and annie's kit clubs is celebrating with a special 75 percent off offer for creative fun hands-on ways for both boys and girls to spend their downtime with annie's kit clubs you have the perfect subscription box for both boys and girls they've got the young woodworkers clip kit club for the boys easy for me to say a monthly subscription that puts real tools into your kids hands starting with that great kid-sized hammer that every boy wants to uh, play with when they're little and every month uh he'll get an all-in-one woodworking kit with the materials and the tools needed to make an awesome woodworking project with minimal supervision and for the young ladies how about Annie's Creative Girls Club, which sends two fun craft projects every month, complete with easy to follow instructions that kickstart her creativity through painting, beading, and more. So help your kids develop actual skills, new crafting techniques that help them express their creativity. Go to annieskitclubs.com. That's A-N-N-I-E-S. Annieskitclubs.com for your uh, uh, children, grandchildren. Get 75% off your first shipment today at annieskitclubs.com slash Steve. All right, coming up in the overtime, we're going to look at some of that polling data that Aaron had about how Americans want to deal with dude looks like a lady when it comes to sports. We'll get into that in the overtime today at blazetv.com slash dace after we record it. It'll get uploaded there for you, our Blaze TV subscribers. So just stay tuned. It'll be up there later today. If you're not yet a Blaze TV subscriber, you can also go to blazetv.com slash dace to become one with a discounted subscription. Tomorrow's the Dace Group. Who was on, by the way? A uh, Shannon. Oh, it'll be good to have her back. Were you guys okay with the topics I chose for the rundown, by the way? Did you I see those? I haven't looked at it yet. Okay. That's my guy. Right on the spot. Yep, perfect. I set it up. You knock me down. I love it. All right, that'll do it for the show. We'll be back at it again tomorrow. Until then, John 317.